And so when I say Chinese, I want you to scream out the, na the nation that's associated with this. For example, if I say Chinese, you're going to say what? China. All right, let's say it with authority. When I say Chinese, you say what? China. All right, that's just a, a test right there. So here we go. Chinese. China. Russian. Russian. Italian. Italy. German. German. Swedish. Swedish. Korean. Korean. Egyptian. Egypt. Nigerian. I hope you were able to successfully identify the issue. The lion won't sleep tonight. Cause we woke now. And we woke now. I said the lion won't sleep tonight. Cause we woke now. And we woke now. Want us to sell our souls to butter profit like God's property is hard to market. So we steady to aim, keep your eyes on target. Cause when you got to drive, yeah, they'd rather you park it. But I don't valet, you ain't getting these keys. I'm keeping close hands, I'm on bending knee. I'm just a reflection, dealing with eight sections. Art mixed with life, you can feel the convection. You lying won't sleep The same people that have stripped us of our identity and labeled us as a, as a color have told us what it means to be black. Assalamu alaikum. In the 13th tribe, Arthur Kosler traces the origin of Eastern Europe's Jewish population that was largely decimated by the Nazi onslaught during the Second World War. Through extensive research, he discusses the history of a trading empire that was set up by a tribe known as the Khazars. The Khazar Empire was located between the expanding power blocks of Christianity and Islam, and the people were converted to Judaism by their king as a way of standing apart from both. The Khazarians and their wealth were dispersed through the countries of Eastern Europe after the collapse of the Khazar Empire. The Khazarians were not a Semitic people that they called themselves Jews after their conversion to Judaism is as absurd as the Chinese Muslims calling themselves Arabs is as the true Jews of Israel are your black ancestors. Are your black ancestors? Are your black ancestors? The true Jews of Israel are your black ancestors. <laughs> uh -huh. You think you and Cow make TikToks together? Cow only cares about money. <laughs> mm. Think about it. Are you really making TikToks together, or is Cow profiting off of you? It's just like the last tribes of Israel. It's just like the last tribes of Israel. I was noticing that you're kind of hanging out a lot with Kyle lately. Is there a problem with that? No, I think it's amazing. It's awesome that someone like you could be okay with someone like him, given all the new information lately. You know, the stuff that's come out about how the Jews stole the black race's identity? That the last tribes of Judah were actually all Africans? You didn't hear about this? Black people are actually the Jews and people like Kyle are taking that from them? Stop talking to me. When the Jews came to America to escape persecution in World War II, they found that blacks were already the underclass in America. So they had to invent a story for themselves which they could make everyone believe because Kyle runs Hollywood. Now I can't figure it out. If y'all are the chosen ones, shouldn't y'all be obeying better than me? I mean, I even try to keep the fourth commandment. Try to keep the Sabbath day holy. I've spent many of hours trying to figure out which is the right 
Sabbath day because we know that old Catholic church something a little fishy about them, don't we? With that white Jesus. I mean, here's a white guy telling you black people that your Messiah is not a long-haired white European guy. Your Messiah is Hebrew, my darker-skinned brothers and sisters. When are you guys going to wake up and become kings and queens? Okay, I was just thinking about this this morning. I grew up Baptist. I went to vacation Bible school. I've read the Bible. I don't know if I'm interpreting it correctly, but if we are made in God's image, right, and the first modern humans originated in Africa, if God has a human form, God is black. God is black. I was a Christian missionary for years, but there came a time in my life when I realized that what I was taught about the Bible was a lie. In my confusion, I cried out for help. I met an Israelite who introduced me to the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, who is described in the Bible as having hair white as wool and eyes red as fire. Yes, the God in the Bible is black. It does not matter what color Jesus was. What matters is that he came to the earth, lived a perfect life, died a death for the sins of the world, and then conquered the grave, proving that he is the Son of God. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. It just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It just God's people, the Most High's chosen, the Hebrews, the Blacks in America, okay? We're about to see some power. Come on, y'all. You got to get out of this lie, okay? You got to get out of this lie. You have got to come out of this lie. This white Jesus that you are worshiping is going to take you to hell. Please wake up. Oh, in the name of Yahusha, wake up. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yahusha is an alpha, strong, black man. He is a Negro. He is a Hebrew. I don't know what word you need to hear to understand who they are. But it is not me. I am not a chosen. You can get mad. It doesn't matter. This is how the Most High has done it. I am a Gentile. And I know my place. But I am called to tell all of these Gentile whites that I know that you are in the deepest deception that you have ever been in. And you have been in it your whole life. And the awakening is happening now. People are waking up. Uh, the entire Bible is about black people. Um, not only was Jesus black, but every character in the Bible seems to be black too. Yeah, Zephaniah and Jeremiah and Jebediah, those, those all aren't white people names, okay? Um, and Jesus wasn't some tan, partially melanated Middle Eastern person either. I'm talking straight up black dude, okay? Even in the book of Revelation, when you get the vision of Daniel, he's describing someone with feet like burnt brass and white woolly hair, and we've got the deep running water voice with the the red eyes and uh, you guys he's black it, the jewish people are black people like kanye was right that's why i'm convinced jesus was black you know because he hasn't come back yet like it's that's the <laughs> he said i will be back in an hour that you least expect it that is the blackest thing i've ever heard <laughs> in my life <laughs> he's gonna confuse the oh i had everybody all, all the white people when he comes back too because he's like it's been a minute <laughs> white people be like it's been two thousand years jesus what are you talking about <laughs> genesis chapter 11 verse 10 explains the genealogy of shem shem was a black man in africa if you repeat this fact, they can't laugh at you. If you repeat this fact, they can't laugh at you. If you repeat this fact, they can't laugh at you. I want to say peace and blessings to everyone. Hope all is well with you guys. 
And um, I know this is a an unscheduled live. And so I decided to do this live. Normally I do this teaching internally. And also I've done this teaching, but um, not the condensed version. I kind of chopped off a lot, you know, because because this is a very lengthy presentation. But I taught on this subject a number of times uh, from different angles. But this time I'm going to teach the subject again about Christ, right? For us, whether or not if he is the father, right? If Christ is the father, right? If he is the father, period, you know, uh, and the father is Christ, you know, that they are one being. And I want to give clarity with this because, uh, you know, this can be very confusing for many of us. And I want to make this clear. This video is not a response video to anyone. Uh, again, I've been teaching on this subject for years. But again, I know this can be a very sensitive area, especially how we were raised in the church and the doctrine that we were subjected to. So what I'm going to teach here is going to give you a lot, uh, give you a lot of clarity on passages that we have been taught and indoctrinated into uh, a way of thinking and a way of approaching the text, you know, in terms of the way we view Christ in conjunction with the Father. And so a lot of this way of approaching the text in terms of viewing Christ really began at the late, uh, the last part of the second century going into the third century and really dealing with the Council of Nicaea is where we really, uh, they really solidified a lot of what we see today. You know, this was prior to that, you know, the, the, the whole, uh, for example, the Trinitarian doctrine was non-existent. And also uh, the way that uh, Christ is being taught in comparison with the Father, you know, because you see that uh, most of the point of emphasis is placed on Christ in the Christian church and not the father. And I want to just kind of walk you through just to give you clarity on what's what, you know, just really let you guys be the jury. My goal here is not trying to uh, deceptively uh, present the information to you from a perspective of to try to sway you over to where I am. This is for you. When it's all said and done, you have to stand before the father and give an account for you. Right. Not for me. I still have to give an account for what I do and how I teach to people, you know, being the watchman. But you still, when it's all said and done, you have to stay uh, uh, stand before the father. So I want to make this clear for those that may try to post comments of, you know, uh, the Romans created Christ or the church created Christ or the council of Nicaea created Christ. That's completely incorrect. Or the council of Nicaea is the one that, you know, you know. Uh, came up with the, the the canon and all that. That's not correct. So the whole purpose of the Council of Nicaea, the argument wasn't to create Christ. The argument wasn't whether or not Christ exists. It was more so about the divinity of Christ. You know, do uh, does he have or do Christ have a point of creation? When you start getting into the arguments of Arius and Athanasius, right? Uh, that was the argument. You know, Arius uh, viewed Christ as being a created being, uh, you know, and uh, Athanasius, you know, which uh, represent the term orthodox, you know, that, uh, you know, Christ has no beginning, you know, Christ has no ending. He was one with the Father from the, you know, uh, be before all of this came into existence. So we're going to deal with that, but I want to make it clear that the Council of Nicaea uh, 321 had nothing to do with creating the Messiah. No, the Romans did not create the Messiah, right? Our Hamashiach. And so again, I just want to just lay the foundation with that. So let's go ahead and cover a couple of things, you know, do a little uh, house cleaning here just to make sure we are on the same page. And as you see here, he is not the father, but is he God? See, these are some of the things that really confuse people because they think that if you say that Christ is not the father, that you're questioning his divinity. You're questioning, uh, you know, because these are some of the things that you get asked. 
if you say that Christ is not the literal father, then the question you get in return is, are you saying that he's not God? See, these are uh, a lot of things that we're going to just navigate through. And this is why uh, this is not a lesson that you can just do in one block. You know, if they argued about this back in uh, starting at the end of the second century, going into the third century, and it was arguing, arguing about this point for years or top of years or top of years. This is not something that you can really get everything consolidated into one session. But I know for sure I got more than enough to to really walk you through. And how to approach the text and how to approach the argument. All right. So here's a uh, couple of disclaimers about this video. For the sake of this presentation, you will hear me use the name Jehovah. You will also hear me use the name Jesus. So I want to make it clear, please don't need anyone trolling inside the comment section about telling us that, hey, the name Jesus, that's not his the name of Yahweh Shai. Some of you guys will say uh, Yahushua or Yeshua. We already know. We know that that's not his name. We know that this is a transliteration of transliterations. So please, let's uh, keep, you know, stay focused and stay away from those type of arguments because that is a distraction to others that really are trying to learn. So I do not need, I don't need you guys uh, or the handful that may come in and hear me say that, don't need you to post that, all right? Don't need those comments, I understand. So for the sake of this presentation, I will be using the name Jehovah as the transliteration for the Most High, for us the Father. And for the sake of this presentation, I will be using the name Jesus. You'll hear me say Jesus, as the transliteration of Yahweh Shai. And if you want to really get an in-depth uh, understanding of the name Jesus, you know, whether or not if it means pig and all that other stuff that you that that is circular circulating throughout this awakening, go to the foundational playlist. I did a full lesson on this name to really really give you an honest uh, approach, an honest teaching with that's free from all this uh, stuff that's circulating with sources again whether you agree or disagree you you are entitled to your opinions you are, you are entitled to accept or reject so i'm not mad at it but let's be respectful uh in our chat and please don't insult uh we woke now this platform all right so let's go ahead and get into it family just want to give some disclaimers here so here's some of the objectives for the presentation on what i'm going to cover today all right. Matter of fact, let me clean this up a little bit. I don't even like how it's transitioning. Didn't know it was doing all of this. So let me fix this transition. I don't like all the movements like that. Let me see if I can fix that real quick. Some of it. Bear with me one second. And let me check the. All right. Let me look into the actual main presentation. I want you guys to get start feeling motion sickness watching the screen do what it do. So let me see if I can correct that real quick. All right. So my apologies. Uh, all right, let me see here. Transitions. So I'll try to catch as much as I can. Uh, like I said, you guys already know I'm a, I'm a stickler for uh, my presentations. I like my presentations to look a certain way, uh, just so that way I think it helps with the presentation of the information. So let me just go through a few more just to make sure. All right. I think we should be good moving forward. All right. All right. My apologies. So the here's some of the objectives for the presentation. And I'm going to cover as much as I can. I know I'm going to have to split this up into two parts, which is fine. Maybe even three parts just to make sure I give you a walkthrough. All right. So. Our objectives for this presentation, we're going to address if Jesus is God. Now, you guys already know, I already gave, laid it out about the name Jesus, about the using Jehovah and also God, because though that, that word God, these are some words that are words of confusion. Uh, but again, it's not a deal breaker. That's why I want to give the disclaimer. I understand the origins and of the each one of each one of these words. 
But nevertheless, if Jesus is God, why did he pray to himself? Right. These are some challenging questions. And see me being uh, an evangelist. I, I started out as an evangelist. Right. A young minister evangelizing. And I would go out to the streets and you would deal with all kinds of people. I've dealt with so many different types of people, all different walks of life, different belief systems, you name it. And there was one experience that I had that really shifted me, that changed me in terms of my approach is me uh, coming across a homeless man that had uh, dual doctorate degrees in theology and, and, and some other areas of study. And, you know, I held my own you know, with him and he commended me, but he gave me some advice. And I mean, here it is, I'm going to witness to him. And he ended up giving me advice on how to approach. You know, he made it clear that I I gave him, uh, uh, arg my argument gave him a whole different view, but he, he just gave me um, some, some pointers on pre how I present the information. And I was a young minister and here it is, I was being uh, taught or how to present my information by someone who is homeless. All right. So these are some of the questions we have to answer. This is why uh, so many people are leaving the church, because many cannot answer this question. And truth be told, uh, on, you know, a study, you know, a survey about the knowledge, the uh, the understanding of the scriptures, the aptitude of the people within the church from the uh, pulpit all the way down to those pews was at a second grade level in terms of understanding the text. So if Jesus is God, why did he pray to himself? And these are some of the questions, uh, the catechism, so to speak, that the Jehovah Witnesses used to pull people out of the church. For a moment, I was a Jehovah Witness growing up, right, before my grandmother uh, interceded. For a moment, I was under Islam for a moment before my grandmother interceded. So I know the arguments. I know the talking points. So the, this is one of those questions. If Jesus is God, why did he pray to himself? Right? If Yah says there is no other savior but him, how can Christ be a savior? Those are some of the questions. We're not going to answer that one today, but we'll get to it. Right? Right? Deuteronomy 24, 16 says, no one can die for another man's sin. So how is it Christ died for man's sin? I'll deal with that, but not today. Uh, that's a whole nother lesson. Some of these uh, uh, bullets are from older presentations. So that's what you're seeing here. Is Christ the arch, uh, archangel Michael, right? But we're not going to cover that today. This is what we're going to cover. Is Jesus God? All right. And again, some of those questions is, if Jesus is God, uh, if Jesus is God, who raised him from the dead? If Jesus is God, who did he who did he pray to? Those are the key things that we're going to cover today. The other ones are covered. And as you can see, uh, like I said, I had to pull. I'm, I'm pulling presentations together. This is an older presentation. I cleaned it up and updated it a little bit, you know, the, the, the graphics and everything. So that's why you see some of the questions here that we're not going to address uh, this this afternoon, we'll do it at a uh, probably part two of uh, just a whole nother segment on that. But we're going to deal with this question here. Is Jesus God? So. Uh, when you start really thinking about this, right, there's a lot of confusion. So even what we deal with this word, God, is the confusing word, God, the name of the most high of Israel. We're going to address that. Is the name of God, is this word God the name of the Father? Is this word God, and I'm not going to go into the details today, but I'm just going to touch on it just a little bit to show how and why there's so much confusion. Because when I hear people say, when you tell people that Christ is not the Father, the next question is, or the, uh, you know, the, the, the response is, are you saying that Jesus is not God or Christ is not God. And this is some of the things that we have. To, we're going to knock this stuff down. We're going to really give proper clarity. So let's start with a source here. Uh, Roman private guides revealing God's name, a secret hidden for century, uh, centuries by the Vatican. 
you know, because this is some of the things you think about, like, man, why do we see all these words like Lord versus the most high's name? Why do we see in the New Testament? Why do we see nothing? We, we see Jesus all through the New Testament. But then when it comes to the father's name, we see God there. The only time we really see the father's name is how is Christ making reference to the father. But for the most part, and I'm not saying every time, but the majority of it is Christ from, from Christ directly from the Messiah, the Messiah's mouth himself. But when you see the father, you see the word God. And now you have to try to dissect and disseminate. Are you when you say God, who are you dealing with? Are you dealing with the father? You know, that's confusing. That's those are words of confusion. So in this article here, I'll read it real quick. It says here in 2017, Pope Francis felt that the Vatican City uh, needed to create a connection with the public. And he realized the need for deeper transparency. This led to the to his request to unseal a set of ancient uh, scrolls from the Vatican secret archives, scrolls that have been secretly concealed from the public for centuries, as it often happens with texts or art deeming threatening or too revealing by the church. Over the centuries, the church has destroyed many art pieces, books and ancient texts to protect its legacy. But that is a story I will share for another moment, another time. But this is the key that I really want to get in, uh, read and want you to hone in on. For now, let's get back to a text that will surely fascinate you with its implications as it will have you wonder about the motivations to keep it hidden, as well as about its meaning. The discovery of the scrolls in question dates back to 70 AD when the Romans seized the Temple of Jerusalem, previously hidden from the knowledge of the church for centuries. These hidden scrolls were obtained in 463 AD and subsequently banned by Pope Hilarius for a very important reason. He aimed to keep the, the true name of God hidden from the people and had it stricken from all official literature. The scrolls contained the true name of God as communicated to Moses in a censored part of Exodus chapter three, verse 14. Ever since the true name of God has been passed down from Pope to Pope as privileged secret knowledge and kept hidden from laymen until Pope Francis decided to put an end to the double life the Vatican uh, was leading by revealing the secret in 2017. But this is what I really want to hone in on right here in Exodus three fourteen, right? Appearing before Moses as a burning bush, God revealed his name, referring to himself as Yahweh, or what we said in the Hebrew tongue as here it says Yahweh. But you see what is called the Tetragrammaton. Now, I'm not going to get into the real name, whether you say Yahweh, whether you say Yahuwah, whether you say Yahweh. Right. But this is the point that I really want to get to, which translates to I am who I am. The church decided that this name needed to be replaced with the word God and Lord. And so Yahweh or Yahuwah or Yahweh. And like I said, family, we're not getting into the proper context. And, but I just want you to understand the main point. Wherever you see the most High's name should be, you see God and you see Lord. Right. Generic terms. God is a German word that comes from the word got. The plurality is gotter, which refers to the Norse gods. I didn't put all of that in here because for the sake of time and Lord, Lord is a political position within the Germans, within the Norse religion. This is where you hear the term Lord of Flatbush. So when you read in your Bible, you see these, you see Lord, you see God. Now you have to pay attention to it. If it's in caps, then you're referring to the name of the father. If you see it in lowercase, then, um, you know, capital L and lowercase follow letters follow. Then you're, you have to figure out, is that Adonai? You, some of you guys will say Adonai. This is done strategically. So was uh, and so Yahweh was stricken from all the passages in the scrolls were kept in the apostolic archives of the Vatican and hid from public knowledge as the name of the God, a uh, name of the, the God was known, uh, was to be known by the Pope only. All right. So that was something that was very interesting because again, when we start understanding this here, you know, uh, when we look at it from 
a perspective, these are some words of confusion, right? The word Lord, the word God, the word Christ, because we, if we leave it up to how we were taught, we would think that the word Christ, Messiah, anointing uh, are not synonymous to each other. All three of those words are synonymous to each other. And the way that we're taught with the, about the word Messiah, about the word Christ, if we look at it to really meaning simply means anointed, then guess what? Now we'll understand why we see the Hebrew word Mashayak being used all through what many refer to as the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. All right. So uh, we'll, you know, we'll deal with that another time. But let's continue here. Another thing I want to lay out that uh, some of the reasons of the confusion, part of the confusion, again, as I pointed out, the Roman Catholic Church, the Christian churches, the, the Christians, the Roman Catholic and Christian schools, the seminaries, they teach this confusion. So I don't hold uh, any any of the lay people, or in other words, others that are trying to learn this and are up under this confusion. So I don't I don't take it like someone's trying to be mis, uh, mischievous or being dis, dis, um, uh, deceptive if they uh, based upon the input of the names and all those things. Why? Because we've been hacked. We've been programmed to approach the text a certain way. And that's the Catholic way of doing things. So that's why when we see the word Trinity, even though many would say, hey, they don't believe in the word Trinity, they still try to push the Trinitarian principles. But we're not going to deal with the Trinity tonight. I mean, today. All right. So this is another thing I want to get uh, lay out the New Testament. Facts about the New Testament, because. I want you guys to make sure that you understand when we say or when you guys or anyone say New Testament, the intention, I want you to understand the intent behind that phrase. Because prior to the second century, right during the time of the Messiahs, I mean, Messiah, rather, the Christ and his disciples, and after his death, burial, and resurrection, they were not using this phrase New Testament. That word, that, that phrase New Testament was put in place for a specific agenda. So let's reveal it real, real quick here, and then we'll get into uh, some uh, walk you through some of the um, the other passages, um, the objectives that I laid out. All right. So the New Testament, the term New Testament came into use in the second century during a controversy among Christians over whether or not the Hebrew Bible should be included with the Christian writings as sacred scripture. Now, I hope you grab hold of that. They were arguing whether or not to even include what is referred to as the law and the pro and the prophets, they were arguing whether or not if that's that's even necessary to include that into their canonized Bible. But without it, Christianity only would only be a few centuries older than Islam. So it had to be this. So that way, of course, Christianity or Catholicism would look or appear to be an older or ancient or religion of the antiquities or belief system of the antiquities. Let me say it that way. So the term New Testament came into use in the second century. That's almost 200 years, almost 200 years uh, at, uh, after the death, burial and resurrection of our Messiah, the Messiah. During a controversy among Christians over whether or not the Hebrew Bible should be uh, included with the Christian writings as sacred scripture. Some other works which were widely read by early church uh, churches were excluded from the New Testament and re uh, regulated um, to. Uh, what, what, excuse me. Thought I heard somebody at my door uh, to the. Uh, collections known as the apostolic fa uh, fathers, right? So in other words, generally considering Orthodox in the New Testament Apocrypha, including both uh, Orthodox and heretical works. So as you see here, they, they did not, as you see here, uh, some other works were widely read by early churches were excluded from the New Testament Right. And as we see here, uh, and this, it points out uh, to the collections known as the Apostolic Fathers uh, and the New Testament Apocrypha. Right. So another point here. Right. The term New Testament is a translation 
from the Latin, um, not going to butcher this, but Novum Testamentum, Testamentum, excuse me if I butcher it, uh, first coined by the second century Christian writer Tertullian. So that's the earliest mention of that phrase or that coin for the canonization of what is referred to as the New Testament. Now, family, I'm not dealing with the, the, the words new covenant. Bear with me one second, family. I thought I heard someone. Someone is at my door. Uh, bear with me one second. Let me get my door real quick. Bear with me one second. All right. Let me play this here. The lion won't sleep tonight. Cause we woke now. And we woke now. I said the lion won't sleep tonight. Cause we woke now. And we woke now. They want us to sell our souls to bottom. Like God's property, it's hard to market So we steady to aim, keep your eyes on target Cause when you got to drive, yeah, they'd rather you park it But I don't valet, you ain't getting these keys I'm keeping close hands, I'm on bending knee I'm just a reflection, dealing with eight sections Art mixed with life, you can feel the convection You lie and won't sleep My apologies, family. Someone was at my door. So I thought I heard my doorbell ring. So, yeah. So I had to go get that. So my apologies. So we already see that there was an agenda not to even include what is called the law and the prophets into the overall canonized text. Right. So now I'm showing you here who actually coined the phrase New Testament. Now, we're not dealing with the phrase that you see within scripture. When you see the word New Testament or New Covenant, that's not the canonization of the testimonies of the disciples, the testimonies. I mean, the writings that you see here, the writings of Apostle Paul and, you know, far as his letters, his Episcopals. That's not when you see New Testament, that's not dealing with uh, the, the, the canonization of those writings. So I want to make that clear because some will, uh, will default to like, well, hey, the New Testament, hey, that phrase is here inside the book. That's not referring to the canonization. Uh, what the what what the Messiah, what Apostle Paul, the disciples, they all taught from what is called the law and the prophets, and then of course the testimonies, right? But anyway, the term New Testament is a translation from the uh, Latin Novum Testamentum. I mean Testamentum. Excuse me if I butcher it. First coined by the second century Christian writer Tertullian. It is related to the concept expressed by the prophet Jeremiah. See, he came up, he coined that phrase based off of what? The phrase, the transliteration, tr transliterated phrase, new covenant. From an ancient Hebrew, it would be renewed covenant, but that's a whole nother discussion, right? The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This has nothing to do with the Roman Catholic Church. This has nothing to do with the Christian Church. This has nothing to do with religious denominations. This is dealing with that, that renewed or some you may say new covenant that was dealing with the actual covenant that the Most High made, as you see here, with the house of Israel, which is the northern kingdom, the house of Judah, which is the southern kingdom. But nevertheless, Tertullian was the first writer to use the term New Testament. This concept of the new covenant is also discussed in the eighth chapter of the letter to the Hebrews in which the old covenant is portrayed as inferior and defective. So this is kind of what plays on people. When you see the word new, you automatically associate that, uh, associate the word old to it. So when you see someone say new Testament, it automatically, when you see old Testament is, it's telling you that the old is outdated. So when you're reading, Everything um, the, uh, the, in your Bibles, and you see all the books that is listed under what they call the Old Testament, they're basically old, meaning outdated. Christ taught from the Law and the Prophets. He didn't teach from what they call the New Testament today. 
He didn't teach it. He was teaching Matthew. He was teaching Mark. He was teaching John and all those guys that wrote their testimonies. All right. So I want to make sure you guys understand why there's levels of, of, of misunderstandings and why it's hard to let go of certain buzzwords because it's been ingrained. This 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 uh, this uh, corrupt teaching, this deceptive approach has been in the works for almost a millennium. Right. So it goes on to say, indeed, many Christians consider the old covenant with the Jews to be obsolete. And we hear that right now. Whenever you hear uh, someone, uh, whenever you hear any of us teach out of what I call the established covenant, which is the law and the prophets, that's what Christ referred to it as the law and the prophets. That's what you'll, you'll see some of that references in Psalms and so forth. They refer to it as the law and the prophets. They refer uh, in the church, uh, in the Christian Catholic church, they refer to this as being old and obsolete or that's something that's only with the the Israelites. All right. So I just want to kind of set the tone with this and, and really knock down a lot of the approach that we were been we've, we've been programmed, pre-programmed to approach to continuously defend a lot of the poor doctrines that was handed to us, the confusions that was handed down to us. All right. So let's go and continue. All right. Uh, uh, I think this pro um, I see pro eight. A professor eight of yeah, we're going to get into it. Let's not get ahead. I'm going to cover, uh, trust me, I'm going to cover Isaiah uh, nine and I'm going to explain that to you because that's one of the the uh passages that many use to try to say, Hey, look, look what Isaiah nine says. No, is I'm going to give you clarity on it. So, family, just be patient with me as we get to that point of the lesson. So, don't, um, don't assume that I'm not going to cover that. So let's not get into discussions before I even get to this point. OK, so let's go ahead and get into a family. All right. We're going to kill two birds with one stone. Excuse me. No pun intended. We're going to address two birds with one stone. Right. A central feature of the watchtower. In other words, the Jehovah Witness doctrine is that Jesus is not Jehovah. Non-Messianic Hebrews and Jews. Right. Orthodox or uh, or Hasidic Jews. Right. Uh, use the following questions. Right. In an attempt to discourage followers of Christ. You know, and so they'll ask a, a, a question more like. Uh, is Jesus. The father. Right. Which would be a more accurate question would be, is Jesus and Jehovah. The same deity. See, they're actually is Jesus God. Is if Jesus is God, then, you know, who raised him from the dead? A more accurate question would be, is Jesus and Jehovah the same deity? All right. I'm going to explain here. So this is a passage that the Christian Catholic Church used to say Jesus is the father. Right. I'm going to show you here. Isaiah nine, chapter nine, verse six. We're going to give proper clarity not with me superimposing my opinion over it. Right. I'm going to I'm going to show you and I'm going to say here, if there's any non messianics, please don't like this. Oh, nope. Not here. My apologies. Hit it wrong. My apologies. Apologies. Uh, LaRonda and moderators, if there's any non messianics that are trying to di discredit uh, our Messiah, kick them out. Give them a warning, then kick them out. So. I'm going to say here, Iman, uh, immune, uh, excuse me, Imuni, Yah, Israel. When you say that there's no Yeshua mentioned in any scripture of Torah, that's an absolute lie. Because if you understand even the word itself, right, that was a common name among the Israelites before, or well, even, even up into the period of the Maccabees, in anticipation that their boys, their sons may be the Messiah. So that in itself, I could debunk that. But I'm going to give you scripture. Right. But you're entitled to believe what you want to believe. But don't po post that disrespectful stuff here. All right. Matter of fact, I'm going to do this. I'm going to save you guys. Because this is where we get and, and moderators. If there's anyone posting this non-Messianic garbage like this person was doing, being disrespectful. Don't even let it sit there. Block it and put them out. Right. Because these people don't even understand 
the entire scriptures is a messianic text. All right. So I want to make sure you guys understand. Be respectful. If you don't believe that's you're entitled to that. But don't post inside this comment section. Don't post on this channel that that stuff that you're trying to push over here. Create your own channel and take it over there. All right, moderators, don't let that stuff, uh, you know, uh, be put on uh, placed inside this chat. All right. So anyone that is posting that stuff here, let's get it out of here because that's being disrespectful. You know, that is very disrespectful. All right. So let's let's bring it back over. All right. So. Let's start with Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. See, just explaining this alone knocks down these non-Messianic people. Let's start with Isaiah 9 and 6. Let's see what it says. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the mighty, and I put here Allah, because that's the actual Hebrew word that's there. So I typed it out for a reason. The everlasting father, Abai Ayad, or Yah, you know, Abai Yahad, however you want to pronounce it. But nevertheless, the everlasting father, and like I said, uh, you could this could be broken down to two words, Aiba Yah, I Ayad, right? But really, here is what I really want to focus on. Aiba, ya, Abba, ya. Well, some of you guys would say Abba, but this is what we're going to focus on right here. Abba, ya. But nevertheless, the everlasting father, the prince, Sha'ar, or Shar, peace, Shalawam. I'll read it one more time. Uh, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called uh, Wonderful Pala or Pala Counselor uh, Yah Waat or Why, excuse me, Yah Waat You know, some would say uh, instead of uh, Taza, some would say use a T S sound. So that's why I say Yah Ah, right? So ya ah, excuse me, ya wa at or ya wa at tzar, and in Israeli they'll make this into a ya, you know, at however you want to pronounce. I'm not getting into all that, but the mighty Allah, uh, Allah, ha, the everlasting Father, you're right? The Prince, and, then, and this is the key word, Abaya Ad or Ayad, right? The Prince Shar or Sha, um, Shaar, but it's Shar of peace, Shalom. But the key is what we want to really I, I'll hone in on, the everlasting father. All right. So is this passage saying that Jesus is the father? This is what many would take and say, Jesus is the father. You know, this is what they would say. Jesus is the father. How do we mitigate that? Is the scripture, let me put it back in. I'll read it without the ancient. Right. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty Allah, Allah, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So is this passage saying that Jesus is the Father? Is this literally saying that Jesus is the Father? That's the question that we have to ask. Is this saying that Jesus is the Father? father is this saying that jesus is the father the literal father i'm going to say absolutely not let's break this down the key to this entire passage is the word name it's a simple word sham uh, that's the ancient hebrew pronunciation of it sham let's see what name sham let's see what it means in Hebrew, what is the meaning of this word name in Hebrew? Notice what it says here. It says, as you see here, a, as a mark or a memorial of individuality. In other words, what this is saying that this is this can be a literal name. Right. So when you see name, 
that could be a literal name, but also, as you see here, by implication, honor, authority, character, uh, fame, and fame. In fame, what? Us. Renowned. Report. And then when we see, when you look at the bottom here, reputation, fame, glory. All right. So we see name can be a literal. It can be literal. Right. Sham can be transliterated into a literal name. But also what it also means is honor, authority, character, fame, renown, report. And I'm going to prove to you that this passage is dealing with the authority, the reputation, not saying that uh, this prophecy is saying that the Messiah is going to going to be the literal father. I'm going to show you that this is dealing with the authority. This is dealing with the character. This is dealing with the reputation. Let me zoom in one more time here. Let me take this down here. Let me zoom in. Reputation, fame, glory, right? The Hebrew word kabod, and you'll see that when Paul talks about taking what? The glory, and that's Romans chapter one, the, the, the glory of the most high and making it into corruptible images. This is dealing with what? The reputation, the character, the fame. Right. So this is what Sham means. It could be a literal name, but it also. The authority and I got other passages that I, that I'm going to go to and I'm going to confirm this, but I want to make sure you guys understand when you see that word name. Are we dealing? You have to make sure when you look at the scriptures. Right. You have to make sure that we understand the difference when you read in the scripture. Are we dealing with a literal name? Or are we dealing with the reputation behind the name? Does that make sense? When Christ said, when you pray, pray what? Our father. That means that Christ is what? Submitting himself under to the father himself. He didn't say when you pray, pray your father. He said when you when you pray, when he taught his disciples how to pray, he said pray our father. But we'll get there. Just a little nugget right there. So I want you to make a note of this right here. Even if you have to take a screen print, I'll pause for a second. If you guys want to make a screen print of this, so that way you understand exactly what this word means. So that word name is a simple word, but when you get the proper understanding of it, then you can see the confusion behind it. All right. So this is again, name, Sean, it could be literal or it can be what? the reputation of the bearer of the name. All right. Because back at that time, they didn't have last names. It was what your reputation of what house you came out of. All right. So let's let, we're going to continue. All right. So remember, Sham means, right. It's a literal title or reputation, character, fame, authority of the one who's carrying the title. All right. So keep that in mind. So is this passage saying that Jesus is the father? I'm going to tell you, no. Is this passage saying that Jesus is the father? Right. So, again, clarity. His reputation, because we're dealing with this person that's being prophesied on. And we want to deal with the person, this is the, the Messiah that is being designated here, that's being referred to here. His reputation, his character, his fame, his authority shall be called. See, when you see that word Sham there, this is telling you about their reputation, the character, the authority. Of the individual that's prophesied here. So it says his reputation and I'm just giving clarity, his reputation, in other words, his character, his fame and his authority shall be called wonderful counselor, the mighty Allah or Allah, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. So this passage is clear that the Messiah reputation, character, his fame and authority would be what of the everlasting father. Excuse the, the dual typo here. That's what this is saying. It said he's going to have the reputation, the authority of who? The father. Oh, we're going to make it plain here. Right now we got to deal with this name, Emmanuel, because Emmanuel ties into that prophecy. 
Uh oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Pastor, you saying that Emmanuel ties into the prophecy I just read? Absolutely. Uh oh, who is Emmanuel? Why was it the Messiah given this name? Uh oh, have uh oh, have you guys got asked that before? Hey, if Christ is uh you know Emmanuel, well, why is his name uh Yahweh Shai or Yeshua or Yahashua or Jesus? Wait a minute. See, we're going to break this down. See, once you understand that word name from a Hebraic perspective, then it everything will fall in alignment. See, family, you don't have to be a master of Hebrew or anything like that. All you have to do is know how to go into the text and just research keywords. This is a simple word. And I know many of you guys probably didn't even think about, hey, you know what? Let me look up that, that word name just to get a better, a more clearer understanding of that word. So I'm going to give you clarity. We're going to answer these questions. So why wasn't the Messiah given this name? Emmanuel. Right. Let's go to Isaiah chapter seven, starting at verse 10. It says this. Moreover, Yahweh spake unto Ahaz, saying, ask thee a sign. Right. So now a sign, a sign, because they're going through persecution at this time. So they, 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 they need a sign, you know, just like what we're dealing with today. We're going through, through persecution right now. We're in this land of captivity. This is a perpetual uh, situation that we've been in when you read the book of Judges. And then when you read the, the four captivities that came immediately after, you know, that period of the book of Judges. Right. You start, you know, seeing that Israel was in a perpetual captivity and each time they were looking for a sign. So it says, ask thee a sign of Yahweh, thy Allah Hayim, Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Notice this here. But Ahaz says, I will not ask, neither will I tempt Yahweh. And he said, hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will ye weary my Allahim also? But here's the kicker. Therefore, Adonai himself, yours to say, Lord, there. This is why we say translations make it means everything. Himself shall give you a sign. So Israel, right, in captivity, looking for a sign. Are we not looking for a sign today? Every captivity, Israel was looking for a sign for the end of their captivity. You know, when you read the book of Judges, every time Israel was in captivity, the Most High raised up deliverers. That's in the scriptures. Every captivity, you're reading just in Judges alone, you'll see like five captivities just in the book of Judges, and you'll see how the Most High raised up deliverers, raised up redeemers, raised up, I'm going somewhere with these terms, but he raised them up. But they were operating under the authority of the Most High, but the key is Israel cried out. Israel cried out and the Most High gave them what? Signs. Are we not looking for signs? That's the prophecy that the Messiah shared in Matthew chapter 24. He said after the great tribulation, they're going to be a great cry. Are Israel not crying out right now? This awakening, this great cry and said that, guess what? Then we're going to start seeing the signs of his return. We're in captivity, right? So let's get back to it. So it says here, behold, a virgin. Right. Alama shall, con shall conceive and bear a son and his and shall call his name Emmanuel. Right. Aman. Aman Wa'al or Aman Al, however you want to pronounce it. Aman Wa'al. Right. Or some would cut this off and say Aman Al. So I'm anyway, I'm just pronouncing it different ways that people pronounce it whether it's in this awakening or whatever, you know, so that's why I'm pronouncing it in different ways. But the key is the sign is going to be who? Whoever is going to be this, be the Messiah, right? It says here his name, right? It says his name shall be called Emmanuel, Iman Nawal, right? So his name shall be called Emmanuel. Remember what that word name means. It could be a literal name, or it could be the reputation behind the name. So it says, Yahweh himself shall give you a sign. So this is coming from Yahweh himself saying the sign, right? There's going to be what? A virgin. This is dealing with the virgin birth, the virgin birth of Christ. Right? Not getting ahead, but it says here uh, on your screen, a sign. Ah, 
What is sign? What does this word sign mean? Plain and simple family. Notice here a signal. But the key is evidence. Miracle. So a sign is what? It's proof. Evidence. Right. So when we look at signs, the key is we're looking for what proof. We're looking for evidence based off of the prophecies that the Most High had given. So I want to, I want to make sure you guys understand here. We're going somewhere. All right, family, let's not get distracted. So and and shall call his name Emmanuel. Right. Imana all or Imana wa all, however you want to pronounce it. Right. So going back here, this is what this name means. Emmanuel means what? It means the most high. It means in a nutshell, the father with us. Right. With us is, as you see here, God, Emmanuel, a type of name of Isaiah's son, because Isaiah had a son named Emmanuel. But this prophecy is not about Isaiah's son. <laughs> so that's why I want the point I want to make as well. Right. But Emmanuel means what? The most high with us, the father with us. Right. And I'm going I'm to double back on this as we progress in this lesson. Right. So the name Emmanuel was given for, uh, for proof and evidence of Yahweh dwelling among us. I want you all to make sure you understand that. So Emmanuel, whoever this person is, whoever the Messiah is, is going to be the representation of the father. What being among us? Uh Oh, I got to I, I know. I know I got to still uh, work this really work this for you guys to really break this thing down. But we'll get there, family. Here it is. So why was it the Messiah given this name? Uh oh. Why was the Messiah not given the name Emmanuel? I'm going to explain it to you, family. Remember, Sham means a literal title or reputation, character, fame. This name was not given as a literal title. But what the reputation, the character, the fame, the authority of the one carrying it. So guess what? The uh, Isaiah chapter seven connects to Isaiah chapter nine, because in Isaiah chapter nine, it gives you more details of the reputation of Emmanuel, the one that's going to operate in the reputation of Emmanuel. All right. So remember. Uh, Sham can be a literal title, but the key we got to focus on as well is the reputation, the character, the fame, the authority of the one that's going to bear it. So the Messiah was given the authority and the presence of Yahweh dwelling among us, but not the literal name. Uh oh. I hope that helped you guys. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 22, and they're going to confirm this. Notice this here. Now, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, fulfilled. What, what, what's the fulfillment here? What's the it? I just gave you two scriptures that ties into this, <laughs> right? I just gave you the, I just, I just gave you clarity here. So what is the it? We just highlighted Isaiah chapter seven and Isaiah chapter nine. Now, all this was done that it might be filled, which was spoken of Yahweh. By the prophet saying, what prophet? I just gave you the prophet Isaiah. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name. There we have it here. Sham, his name, Iman, right? Imana all or Imana wa all, right? Shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is Adonaiya. In other words, there it has the word Lord. And when you see it in the Greek, it's telling us it means master. So master or superintendent, the word is Adonaiya in the Hebrew. So that's why you see here on your on your screen, Adonaiya is with us, right? Adonaiya is with us. So the father is being with us. The superintendent of the house, which is the father, is with us. So his reputation is Emmanuel. Right. So the ark, this is why I want you guys to understand this. I hope you guys grab hold of this. Right. I hope you grab hold of this. Right. 
See, Israel already understood having the presence of the father being among them. They understood having the presence of the father, a representation of the father among them. It was called the Ark of the Covenant. But now instead of having this physical box, right, the prophecy is that, guess what? The Messiah is going to come and he is going to be what? The physical presence, right? The physical representation of the father's what? Word among us. Oh, come on, family. I hope you guys hold, uh, grab hold of this, right? The Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of Yahweh dwelling, uh, dwelling with the Israelites. But guess what? Not the literal name. The Ark of the Covenant is not the literal name of the Father. It represents two parts here, and I'm going to break it down real quick. So we understand when we say uh, Christ, right? The, our Hamashiach is not the father, but it does not diminish his divinity. It doesn't diminish who he is, right? He's still in an authoritative position. And unfortunately, the way Christianity and Catholicism, the way that they have brainwashed us, that if you say that Christ is not the father, now you're reducing his divinity. You're making him less valuable. No, we're knocking down all those poor teachings. So the Ark of the Covenant represents uh, the presence of Yahweh, all right, dwelling among the Israelites, but not, it's not a literal name, right, of the Father. So let's go to Exodus chapter 25, starting at verse 21, and let's confirm this. And thou shalt put the mercy seat, right, the mercy seat above the Ark. Let me say that again. Let me say that again. Thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I give that I shall give thee. So we have two parts here. We have the mercy seat, which is the, the lid, right? The lid. And he says that in, in the ark shall put the testimony I shall give thee. Verse 22. And the and there will uh, it says, and there I will meet with thee and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. Right. From between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things, which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So it says the mercy seat is where the father will meet with the high priest. So guess what? We see that that mercy seat is a representation of the father being among Israel. Matter of fact, the whole Ark of the Covenant, right, is the presence of the father among the Israelites. We see uh, when you read uh, Eli's son, they took what? The Ark out there representing what? Having the presence of the most high among them. When uh, the, the, the Jericho, right, when they walked around Jericho, Right. They had the ark preceding them. That means the presence of the father going before them. OK, but let's break this down. Let's break this down because uh, we, we really got to give clarity here. So what was a key item inside the ark? What was the key or item inside the ark? Well, let me break it down. Exodus 25, 16 is going to give you a key item inside the ark. It says the stave shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. So inside the ark, right? Because without the, 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 uh, the item, without the testimony inside the ark, the ark will be just what? An empty box. So in, the key is what's inside the box, what's inside the ark, right? Which is the testimony. So let's look at the Hebrew definition of the word testimony, right? We see here, I bought, right? It says here. A witness, testimony, a recorder. So testimony is a recorder. So we have something inside the ark, a testimony, something that's recording what? <laughs> recording the most high's promises. Re re recording the most high's what? Commitment. Recording what? The agreement. That's inside the ark. So what did the testimony record? And I'm going to give it to you. The testimony recorded the covenant. What is the words of the covenant? Guess what? So the testimony is really the recording of what? The covenant, the proof of the covenant. Witness the covenant. The covenant is synonymous with what? Testimony. It is the testimony of what? The witness between Israel and the Most High. 
inside what? That's contained inside this ark. But here's the kicker. We're not going to stop there. So what is the words of the covenant, right? Exodus 34, 28. Let's see what's the words of the covenant. And he, Moses, Masha, was there with Yahweh 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words, uh oh, wait a minute, of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Whoa, wait a minute. So inside this box, inside the ark, right, we had the mercy seat, but within it is the word. Wait a minute. Well, what's the word? <laughs> the word is the Ten Commandments. So guess what? When we read the scriptures and say that Christ is the word, uh oh, come on, family. I hope this hope helps you guys out. I hope this helps you guys out. So Christ is the word. That means that Christ is this covenant. Christ is the literal covenant. He is, he is the covenant that came and dwelt among us, put on flesh instead of this wood. He came in the flesh and dwelt among us. Come on, family. We, get, we have to put things in its proper perspective. But the covenant, right, was not the mercy seat. Uh oh, let me say that again. The covenant was not the mercy seat. That was another section of the ark. The covenant, right, had its place inside. But we also see that there was other items there. But I want to make sure you understand that when people say that they believe in Christ, when they say Christ is the word, what is the word that became flesh? The covenant, the commandments that the Most High had given Noah, I mean, not Noah, but Moses, those tables, it went from being written down to now Christ, what, walking it out. So anyone that says that we are not under the, we, we, we don't have to honor the Ten Commandments. Ten, the tenth letter, Yod, represents what? Salvation. If you say that we don't have to honor the Ten Commandments, you teaching another Messiah. You teaching the Messiah, but not the Messiah, because we see the word manifested itself and came down in this flesh to dwell among us. Now we're getting into what? Back into Emmanuel, which means Yah with us, the father with us. Right. Emmanuel. Remember the reputation, the reputation in uh, Isaiah chapter nine. All those titles is still what encompassed in what the reputation, the authority that the most high will give the person that's bearing the reputation of Emmanuel. But guess Guess what? They are still that there are still two separate from each other. But they both are divine. The father is the head. See what Christianity teaches us that, you know what? The father and the son and the Holy Spirit, we have three heads. Come on, family. If you have three heads inside your household, you're going to have confusion. Even Paul talked about having multiple people speaking in one engagement. It'll cause confusion. So you cannot have three heads in the household. You have to have one head. There's one head of the house, right? My wife and I, guess what? We're married. We're in covenant. I'm the head of the house. But guess what? She, it does not diminish her being my wife. It doesn't diminish her existence. We are one through marriage. When you see me, you see my wife. When you see my wife, you see me. When you see our children, you see our entire family, the, the, the signs, the proof and evidence of our covenant. Let me stop right there. Come on, family. Come on, family. And we're going to give clarity. That's why I said that word God is a word of confusion. That's right. Daily repentance. The commandments came straight from the father. OK, so. There was a distinction. Between the mercy seat, which was the lid, the golden pot, Aaron's rod that budded, and the covenant. These three things, the golden pot, Aaron's rod, and the covenant, uh, that the, which had the words, not a blank, that was inside the ark. The mercy seat was the lid that sealed it, right? Within it is what? The covenant, the testimony. The proof, the evidence of the agreement. All right. So likewise, there is a distinction between the father and his son. Let me say that again. You had the mercy seat. It didn't have two mercy seats. It didn't have two lids on it. It just had one seat, one for the one to sit upon the throne. Oh, man. <laughs> one to sit upon the throne, not two to sit upon the throne. 
anyway, let's give clarity here, family. Let's go to John chapter one. Let's 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 confirm this. Right in your Bible, right in your translation, your KJV is going to say this. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with the word. Now, you know. We're always taught, right, coming up in, in the church that we have to have Christ in our heart. But the Most High said that he was going to renew his covenant. And we already see that the Ten Commandments is his word. So we that is what? Confirmation, if we're going to say it from what we say, we have to have Jesus in our heart. That means that that's the circumcision of the heart. The covenant coming into what? This physical vessel, which is what? An ark. Anyway, let me leave that alone. So in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, there's so much to unpack. But guess what, family? This is where it gets confusing. Because how do you how do you transliterate these words? How do you take theos? And wh where is the father here? Where is the father in this text? How do you get the proper translation of this word? You can't just depend on the Greek. You have to go all the way back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 to really get proper clarity of what this actually says. And if you, un I'm not going to get it. I was going to go into another place. I'm not going to add that here. So this word God is a word of confusion. Do you guys agree? Does, does this mean that does, do you guys see the confusion here? Do you guys see the confusion here? So let me break this down. How do you distinguish the word of God, right? That word God being used for the father or that word God being used for Allah slash Elohim? Because I say Allah many say Allah while others say Elohim. So I'll put both of them here, which means magistrate. It means counsel, right? So how do you distinguish God feels, right? From meaning counsel, magistrate, from meaning what? Father. How do you make the distinction between the two? So why see, you know, why do we see, excuse the typo here, I, I got to go back and um, proofread this. Man, I, I should do it now, but I don't want to take too much time doing it. Why do we see, uh, or why do we see the distinction of the son, but not the father in the, in the different versions of the Bible? Why don't we see the father? We should be able to see as some type of distinction here, right, family? We should be able to see a distinction. And I'm going to show you, family. We, we are not going to, and, 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 I, and I want to encourage you guys, don't guess. Right? It's not the, it's, and I want to make this clear. It's not, uh, you know, actually, I'm not even going to do that. I, let's just stay on, for, let's stay, stay on topic and let's, Wait as I continue to pro um, progress in this lesson. So, but why don't we see the distinction of the father here? Now, if you study the scriptures, right, and you study Genesis, not just chapter one, but also chapter two, you'll understand what you see here. You'll understand this here. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with Yahweh. And the word was Allah <laughs> The same was in the beginning with Yahweh. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Pastor, are you saying that that's how we, that, that, that would be the proper translation if we studied it from the Hebraic school of thought from Genesis 1? <clears throat> excuse me. In Genesis 2? Yeah, family. Yes, family. All right. All right. Prove this, prove this, prove this, because some of you guys may say, hey, the word was was the father. But we want to give clarity on this. We are going to give clarity on this. If Jesus is God, why did he pray to himself? Right. That's a question we got to ask. Right. If Jesus is God who raised him from the dead. Right. So we're going to bring all of that together. Trust me, I'm going to get to the Genesis. Let's go to Acts chapter two, starting at verse 23. And I'm going to bring all of this. I'm still going to get back to Genesis. This is going to get me over to Genesis. So I need to get over to Genesis. I can't just jump to Genesis. I got to give you 
proper hermeneutics, biblical hermeneutics over the text, not piecemealing stuff together, not just trying to tell you what I want the scriptures to say. So let's go to Acts chapter two, and we are going to tie this in. You're going to see how I want to tie this into Genesis. We'll get there. I got right. Verse 23, being delivered by the determined uh, um, by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge. And I didn't put the translation of it. I just say here, put left God here for knowledge. God, ye have taken by wicked hands, have crucified and slain. This is dealing with the Messiah being crucified whom God hath raised up. See, I left that general there for a reason, because we need to understand this is where the confusion is, because I'm going to tell you that what should be here is the father. The father, his, the father should be here, whom the father hath raised up. Right. Right. For knowledge of the father. But let's go ahead. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I know I'm letting the cat out the bag a little. I hope you guys grab hold of this Whom The father or whom God hath raised up have loosened. Uh, loose the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. So this is why I say, why do we have to sit here and try to figure out, disseminate this? Will we see God here? Is it referring to the father or are we referring to the council, the magistrate? That's the confusion. That is the, the confusion, because now you got to you got to try to decipher who are we talking about? Are we talking about singular, the father, or are we talking about the council? Let's let's go ahead and give clarity here, family. Let's give clarity whom God raised up. Let's answer this question. Was it the father who raised him or the council? It starts with understanding the first and second Adam. Uh oh, uh oh. I got one more passage I'm going to give you. We're about to get to Adam. Check this out, family. First Corinthians, we're going to use Paul to set us up to get to Genesis. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 44 through 46. Notice what it says here It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there's a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. In other words, able to work, revive, resuscitate, right? Resurrect. That's why Christ said, I am the resurrection. But watch how we tie all of this together, right? Adam was made a living, a living soul, but he was physical first. Uh oh, that's what, let's break this down. How be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural and afterward that which is spiritual. OK, hmm. now how do we reconcile this to Genesis? Well, let me show you who raised up the first Adam from the ground. I'm going to ask you guys this question. Who raised Adam from the ground? Who raised the first Adam from the ground? Who raised the first Adam from the ground? Was it a council? Or was it the father who raised the first Adam from the ground? Come on, family. I know I'm giving you guys a whole deeper dive, a deeper discovery. See, this is why this is what I teach internally. But, you know, I want to give clarity because there's a lot of confusion in this awakening. And I don't want us to bring the confusion that's in the Roman Catholic Church and Christianity and bring that spirit over here. And then we still perpetuating and doing the playbook of them still causing us what to have a Catholic mindset. So who raised up the first Adam from the ground? Who raised it? Was it a gen what was it the the council? Or was it when when I say the council, was it Allahim or Elohim? Because it means council. Or was it who raised him from the ground? Uh oh, I know y'all seeing where I'm going at with this. Let's go to Genesis chapter two, verse seven. Right. Because in chapter one, we see in the beginning. Right. We see Allah Hayim. It say Elohim. But see, it's giving you an itinerary. It's giving you a layout of the creation. Right. But then when you go over to chapter two, chapter two is more of a in-depth discussion, explanation of the creation. And look at who you see here. Right. This is what you will see in Genesis chapter two. Verse seven, this is Moses giving you more of an in-depth account of the creation. 
No, this is not a second creation like some would try to teach. No, this is one teaching, one creation. If I if I if I had time, I would I would put some uh, Josephus references here because Josephus makes it clear that this is what was being taught by our ancestors uh, in the antiquities. That wasn't two creations. This was being taught that uh, the the Most High through Moses is, is giving more of an understanding, a detail, more of an in depth understanding of the creation process. So here we see Yahweh Alahayim. Wait a minute. So when we see Yahweh Alahayim, this is what you see here. Let me see here. Verse seven. Now I'll zoom it in. This is why I say words of confusion. And the Lord God formed man. Wait a minute. So the actual Hebrew term or phrase you'll see here, and Yahweh Alahayim. So now we see that word Alahayim, yours is say Elohim. What that is telling you is you being used in the singular, not plurality. Yahweh Alahayim. So this tells us that the father is in charge here. Notice what it says here. And Yahweh Alahayim formed Adam from the dust of the ground, Adama, and breathed, right? Nashama, right? Breathe, Nashama, breathe into his nostrils the breath of life, Chai Yam. I'm saying it in the ancient Hebrew, Chai Yam. In other words, he continuously breathed breath into his into the nostrils of Adam. It wasn't a one time like you resuscitating the person. You're doing it what continuously, right? So the yam at the end, that's plural, masculine plural. So the most high continuously breathed his breath into Adam and man became a living soul. So we see here it was Yahweh Alahayim that raised, that raised Adam from the dust of the ground. The key is his son, the Messiah, is going to have this authority. He's going to have a reputation of the father, but he's not the father. He always made it clear that he is not the father. I hope this helping someone here. I hope this helping. See, family, when you talk about breathing, le uh, breathing life, it's a continuous thing. That's right, CPR. The father breathed and he was breathing his breath into Adam continuously. It wasn't a one time thing. But we're not, we're not going to stop there, family. We're not going to stop there. So the scripture is clear that it was Yahweh, the father, who raised Adam from the ground. It's clear. It was Yahweh, the father, who raised Adam from the ground. So likewise, it would have to it would have been the father who raised Jesus from the dead. Let me say that again. Likewise, it would have been the father who raised Jesus from the dead. Come on, family. Come on, family. So why does the scripture says Yahweh Alahayim? Uh oh, we're going to bring this together. Right. Because remember, I said Yahweh Alahayim. This means singular. So we know that the father raised the first Adam. So this means that, guess what? The father raised the second Adam, which is Christ, from what? The dead. Oh, man. Does that make sense, family? Am I, am I, am I breaking down these strongholds that's been enslaved, enslaving us by, by the church? Let me, let, me, let, me, let me prove this, family. Let me prove this. Let me prove this. Let me prove this. And I'm going to say this, family. Look, uh, Valor, I want to I want to make sure you understand this and others. Please don't post all kinds of scriptures trying to uh, cause confusion. This is not a debate. If you have questions, if you want me to cover other scriptures, then send me those scriptures in the email. I am not uh, going on this tail end and you guys dropping all kinds of scriptures inside the text like you're trying to challenge the lesson. That's disrespectful. Send me an email. And I, I don't have a problem with going over those passages, but not in this lesson. Let's do things in decency and order. The disciples didn't do that with Christ. So and I'm not saying that I am the Messiah. So let's make sure that we do things in decency and order. And moderators, if people are just posting passages like they're trying to prove a point or like they're trying to go against the, uh, the lesson. Hey, if they don't do it the proper order, give them a warning and then kick them out. 
because we got to start doing things in order. Have the same respect on this channel and the same thing when you go to other channels. That's disrespectful when someone is given a lesson and you steady trying to challenge it by posting scriptures. Come on, family. That's not how we're supposed to do. The disciples never did that to Christ. Let's let's do things in order. Proper etiquette, because because you're actually causing confusion. No, and see, this is where you get into people operating in a, a victim spirit. When uh, when someone posts here, I can't post Bible here. But you're posting things to try to contest the lesson. So, family, this is the prime example. Want to be dis disrespectful and play the, the victim. I got this one on uh, moderators. That's disrespectful, family. That you, you don't do that. That's not how we do that. And that's not that's not the father. That's that that's that's what happens. And I appreciate it. Seducing spirits. So I'm, I, I put the person out. I blocked them. You know, we're going to keep moving forward. You know, you could do that in other channels if you choose. But I say this, family, don't do that in other channels. If we be the people of the most high, let's be respectful. You know, don't go to other channels. Whether you agree or disagree, take notes and talk to that person. You know, or ask a question and that person will respond and say, hey, you know what? Let me let let, let you know, let me uh, make a note, not address that in an, another teaching. But don't constantly post in scripture after scripture like you trying to contest what's going on. Don't do that on these other channels. You know, the, when the disciples had questions with the Messiah, right, a true disciple, just like just like what they did. They went to Christ in private. So don't go to any other channels because I'm teaching something here. And you go over there and they teach you something that's different. Don't go over there saying, well, Pastor Kelly taught this. Nah, uh, -uh. we don't we don't need instigators. So let's get back into it, family. My apologies. And I want to give a couple of shout outs here uh, because I see some um, contrib um, contributions here. Uh, I want to give a, a special shout out to uh, pr uh, privacy. All praises to the most high. I want to give shout outs to you. Thank you for the contributions. Family, let's show privacy, some love and support. Also, let's show some support for Tangi Ya, Black to My Roots. Let's sh let's give a shout out to them for the contributions tonight. Really appreciate you guys for the love and, and support. So let's get right back into the lesson. But again, moderators, anyone that's trying to teach in the comment section, you know, give them a warning. Uh, and then put them out, maybe give them a one minute warning. And then if they come back doing the same thing, then completely block them because we have to have decorum, right? Decorum. Come on. Come on. Um, we woke now. Let's let's be the example to our rest of our brothers and sisters that we're going we're going to have order here. And if you go into others, others channels that you're still going to be respectful, whether you agree or disagree. All right. So why does the scripture say uh, Yahweh Ahayim versus just saying Allah Ahayim? Well, let me explain what is the meaning of Allah Hayim, right? And I know you guys say Elohim, so I'm not, uh, when I say Allah Hayim, think of Elohim, all right? The Hebrew definition of Elohim, because uh, in, the, uh, in your sources, you're going to see Elohim, right? So that's a whole nother discussion, but with, let's use Elohim synonymous to Allah Hayim. Let's get this message forward. I'll bring this message, message forth, right? So it says God's in the ordinary sense specifically used and it, when it says here in the plural does especially with the art, article and when you start dealing with the article this is where you start getting into like ha right why but ha is a, a, a major article ha the transliterates to the but anyway <clears throat> so the is a what is called a definite article right so this adds more what uh it it, it, re, it removes the confusion. It's more direct, right? It, it removes all the um, ambiguity, so to speak. So God's in the ordinary sense, used specifically of the supreme God, occasionally applied, <clears throat> excuse me, by way of deference to magistrates, right? Angels, judges. So it's saying that Elohim can refer to the supreme God, and that's still not giving you uh, the full details of it, but it's enough to go off of. But the key is we see magistrates, 
We see angels. We see judges. This is all part of what? When we say Elohim or Allahim. So when you see uh, Allahim or Elohim, think of magistrates, think of counsel. Because angels are part of the council. Judges are part of the council. Or part of the magistrates. So let's go to the Zondering. Let's see what it says. It says Elohim, right? Or Allahim, the most frequent Hebrew word for God over 25,000 times in the Old Testament. The sad thing about it is you don't see this. You see this transliterated word God that's filled with confusion. So it says plural in form, but singular in construction. Right. So it goes on to say uh, when applied to the one true God, the plural is due to Hebrew idiom of a plural magnitude of majesty. Right. So, again, <laughs> right. We see Yahweh Allah that's singular and that's letting us know that he's above all. <laughs> right. But anyway, when use of heathen gods. Right. Saying that it could be used of uh, referring to uh, uh, deities of other other um, nations or of angels, right? This is where you see the sons of God in your Bibles, Ban Banya Alahayim. All right. So it, it tells us Elohim is plural in sense as well as form, but it also means strong or be in front. All right. So this is where I also want to break down this word Godhead, because this word Godhead can be very confusing because Godhead is being used synonymously to what? The Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. When you when you uh, hear people who talk about the Trinity and you tell them that, hey, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, that's not in it. The Spanish, the Greek, whatever there's, it's not in the scriptures. So they'll point you to Godhead. Right. They'll say, hey, here it is. It's Godhead. All right. Well, let's break down what the Godhead is. Does that word Godhead give validity to the Trinity? I'll say that again. Does the Godhead break? The, uh, th th does that give validity to this Trinitarian doctrine? No. Let's go to Romans chapter one, verse 20. It's, it's, it's like three or four instances. You'll see the word Godhead. But let's read it in, within the scriptures. It says, for the for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even the internal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. So wait a minute. So you say Godhead is supposed to be father, son and the Holy Spirit. You're saying it's supposed to be a council. What is what does it mean? Well, let's go to the Greek definition of Godhead. Simply put, divine nature. But you see God here, right? But that still doesn't give you the definition of it. But we see divinity. In other words, divine nature. So when you see God here, divine nature. Theates, right? Divine nature. That's what it's saying. Theates is supposed to be divine nature. But let's go to the etymological dictionary definition of God here. Let's see what it says here. It says again, divine nature. Wait a minute. So you say Godhead simply means divine nature. Right. It says divine nature, deity, divinity. Right. Uh, we see here. Uh, God had. Right. Which means divine nature, state or condition of being a God. So in a proper tense, it's re it really means Godhead simply means divine. Right. So the the word Godhead, the um, theo, theotis, excuse me, theotis, excuse me, or theates, however you want to pronounce it, means divine. It comes from the Greek word uh, theos, which means divine Godhead. But it also comes from the Greek word theos. So let me say that again. The word Godhead, theates or theates. Right. Means divine. Comes from the word Greek word theos, which means divine Godhead, but it ultimately comes from the word, the Greek word theos. You see how this could, you, you know, the most high is man. The most high is simple. 
All right. But let's go to break this down. Let's go to Theos. So we already see Theates, uh, Theates, right? We also see Theos. But let's go to the root, the, the root of these words. Let's go to Theos. I know some of you guys are like, man, that is confusing. Just trying to even read that, right? So Theos, a deity, the supreme divinity. But notice what we see here, magistrate, right? A general name of deities. Then we see Godhead. Then we see Trinity. You see, you see, these are added entries. These are added entries because Theos, <laughs> anyway, that's a Greek term. So when you start seeing these additional entries, now we start seeing the order of when things were added to the definition. So we already know from a Greek perspective, theos, right? It could be singular or plural because this is this is a word that's based upon their culture, not based upon the ancient Israelite culture. But nevertheless, theos can be what? Singular or plural. It can be, as you can see, a god or goddesses or, or a goddess. It says a general name of deity. So this is getting into pluralities, divinities. Then we see Godhead, Trinity. Uh, so Theos is a transliteration of Allahayim, if we understand it. And this is where the confusion is. Theos is a transliteration of Allahayim, some say Elohim, right? So Yahweh Allahayim is used in the singular when Adam was raised from the ground. Uh-oh. Now I said all of this to say, I'm setting you up here, guys, to give you proper clarity of when you see Yahweh Alahayim, this is singular. This is why it's confusing when you see God in the beginning, the word was, uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and all things were made by God. That's a, that is so confusing. This is why it's confusing to many when you say to them, hey, Christ is not the father. They are two, they're separate, right? They are actually the question, are you saying that Christ is not God? See, that is a word of confusion, family. So we, and, and, and I'm going um, to um, answer that question later. But that's a great question, um, Apollo. When, when I get a message saying the Holy Spirit is my tutor, it's talking about Theos? Nah, because if you understand ancient Hebrew, the Holy Spirit has a name. Guess what the Holy Spirit name is? Not Rawak HaKadash. Some of you guys would say Ruach HaKadash. No, that's not the name of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit name is Rawak Yahweh. Some of you guys would say Ruach Yehuah. Or Ruach Yahweh. In other words, the spirit of Yah. So the Holy Spirit is Yah's spirit. Oh, man, let me leave that alone. Come on, family. Come on, family. I'm just giving you some understanding here to knock off this stuff. You know, the father has a, a literal name. The son has a literal name. But then we have a generic term for the Holy Spirit. No, the name of the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Yah or Rawak Yahweh or if you said uh, uh, a different tense, you may say Ruach Yahweh or Ruach Yahuwah. See, the, we're tearing down this Trinitarian doctrine. Because because when we say Holy Spirit, we're still dealing with the spirit of the Father. And guess what? The Father doesn't have two spirits. The Father says that he is a spirit, right? And we have to worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. So when you say the Father and you say the Holy Spirit, now you're creating two spirits. Oh, come on, family. It's the spirit of Yah. It's still his spirit. It's still him. So let's break, let's, let's break this down. Let's break this down. And family, you're entitled to disagree. You're entitled to disagree. I'm not forcing my stuff on you, but I want to make sure you understand the scriptures free from the influences that we've had. Go back over, take notes. And if you have questions, shoot me an email. But let's not debate it right now. Yahweh Alahayim is above all within the council. Let me say that a bit, say that again. Yahweh Alahayim is above all within 
the Allah Hayim or Elohim. He's above all. That's why you see Yahweh Allah Hayim being specified here in Genesis chapter two, giving clarity to Genesis chapter one. All right. So guess what, family? Israel is part of this council. Uh -oh, I'm going somewhere, family. Remember, I, I still haven't let go of Isaiah nine. I'm getting there. But I got to get you. I, I, I want to teach you. I don't want to just throw scriptures on you. And then, you know, like I'm piece milling uh, 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 the, the text together. No, I want to walk you through and explain every detail of it. That's why it's going to take time. So Israel is part of this council family. Israel is part of the Allah Hayim, part of the Elohim. Well, let's confirm this with the 82nd book of Psalms, starting at verse six. Right. Well, I have six and seven here. It says, I have said, ye are Allah Hayim. Yours translation would say gods. And all of you are children of the most high, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So guess what? We just see, we just saw that the word Allah Hayim or Elohim is referred to who? The children of Israel. Oh, wait a minute. So the children of Israel, remember when we broke down that Zondervan Bible dictionary definition, you saw the word judges. Who are the judges? Uh oh, uh -oh. I know I'm messing up some theologies here because when we look at the book of the judges, we can also say the book of the Allah Hayyam or Elohim because the judges were a council. Oh, is this helping you guys? Come on, family, we're going to break this down. How do we know? See, this is making it clear. We are part of the Allah Hayyam or Elohim, the magistrate. But here's the kicker. But ye shall die like men. This is telling us we're not the father. This is telling us that we're not above the father. This is telling us that there are limitations to this flesh. Now, let's prove that we're dealing with the councils, the, the judges, the leaders. Right. Because more specifically, the leadership in Israel is part of this council. Here's proof, starting at verse one and two. Allah Hayyam standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judges, judgeth among Allah Hayyam, in other words, counsel and magistrate. That's why you see that inside your translation, this in parentheses. How long will ye judge unjustly? See, the judges were corrupt. They were called Allah Hayyam. The judges, the, they were corrupt. Right. So now judgment is coming towards them. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Uh Oh, see, see, that's why I said they would die as men. These guys are not above the most high, the father. No one is above the father. Uh, um, Abba, Abba, Yah, Yahweh. And I'm going to prove this. So Israel's judges have failed miserably, miserably in their responsibility to fairly apply Yahweh's laws, statutes, and commandments to the community, to society. Yahweh's charge against them was straightforward. They were guilty of gross injustice. Yahweh condemned them because their abuse of power by asking them how long they would continue to pervert justice. So. Further proof that it was specifically Yahweh who raised the Messiah from the dead. Let me give you further proof. Now, we're still going right back to Adam. I told you I didn't leave you there. Uh, we already dealt with the first Adam. So now let's deal with the second Adam. Let me give you proof that it was Yahweh and Yahweh alone. We're being specific. We're not going to use it was God that raised him from the from raised the um, Messiah from the dead. We're going to be more specific on who exactly raised him from the dead. So let's go to Hosea chapter six, starting at verse one. It says, come, let us return unto who? Yahweh. Come, let us return. This is where you get the word convert. Shawab, right? Means return to Yahweh not to a religion. Come, let us return unto who? Yahweh, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. After two days, he, still dealing with Yahweh, he will what? Revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up. And guess what? And we shall live in his sight. Wait a minute. So we see the most high, his son, I mean, most high is what he's he he 
is going to revive. That's the prophecy, right? He's reviving who? His son. Not man, not a single man revived his son. It's the father, the next of kin, right? When we start dealing with redeemer, it means what? The next of kin. The father is the next of kin to the son. He's the head. He's the head of the house. He's the Adonaiah. He's the superintendent. So guess what we see here? Come, let us return it to who? Yahweh. For he, Yahweh, had torn and he, Yahweh, will heal us. He, Yahweh, has smitten. He, Yahweh, will bind us up. But here's the kicker. Verse two, after two days, he, Yahweh, will revive us. Right? Now you see that word, chai, right? Remember, kayam, when we, when we dealt with Adam, right? It was a perpetual. He was continuously breathing before Adam became a living soul. And it says, in the third day, he will raise us up. Uh-oh, doesn't that sound familiar? And we shall live in his sight. Still dealing with Yahweh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Then shall we know if we follow on to Yahweh. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter, and the former rain unto the earth. Guess what, family? I'm giving you nothing but scriptures. I am proving to you it was Yah and Yah alone that raised Christ, his son, Ban Alahayim, from the dead. It wasn't some generic word, God. You should not have to try to figure out who raised Christ from the dead. No, it wasn't God that raised Christ from the dead. We're going to be specific with who raised him from the dead. It was the father. It was Abba Yah, Yahweh. Come on, family. See, we, we've been taught to minimize, emasculate the father. Oh, let me let me let me prove it, family. I, I, I got to still I got to I got to bring this home. Right. The 82nd book of Psalms, verse six. Right. Oh, actually, that's that, that shouldn't be there. Right. Let's go to John 10. Right. Let's take Psalm. Let's take the 82nd. Well, I got to delete that. I got to go back over. All right. Let's go to John chapter 10. Right. We're going to bring all of this together here. See, I'm still dealing with Genesis chapter one. I'm still dealing with uh, Isaiah chapter uh, seven. I'm still dealing with Isaiah chapter nine. Emmanuel, the reputation of. But I want to make sure you guys understand J John chapter 10, starting at verse 30. It says, I and my father are one. Uh oh. Is this a deal breaker right here? Uh oh, pastor, you're going to have to explain this, pastor, because Christ said I and the father are one. Because now now you're getting into the arguments when you start getting into the late second century, going into the third century, because they were saying, wait a minute. Christ said I and the father are one. Those Christians, those Roman Catholics didn't understand the Hebrew tone of the text. They didn't understand because they dismissed the law and the prophets. So now here it is. Now they beginning to create their own own doctrine by saying hey christ is he is equal to the father that he had see this is where we start getting into uh this thing where as though we diminish the father by saying that now we got three heads that's what the trinitarian doctrine uh decided during the council of nicaea with that trinitarian doctrine that there's three operating as one the father son and the holy spirit trinity now family i'm not diminishing the father, I'm not diminishing the son and I'm not diminishing the spirit of Yah. But let's give proper clarity to what the scripture says. It says, I and my father are one. Then Judah took up. That's why I put Judah here. I didn't want to just put that generic word Jew. Judah took up stones to stone him. Yahweh shy. Jesus the Christ answered them because we're not dealing with a generic construct. We're dealing with Yah's people, many good works have I showed you from my father. Wait a minute. So Christ is still making a distinction. Many good works have I showed you from my father, from which of those works do ye stone me? So Christ is saying, I and the father are one, but everything that you see that I do comes directly from the father. So wait a minute. If Christ is the father, why don't he just say everything comes from me? I am myself. I am the father. Why don't he just say I am the father? Why is he saying I in my father? Are one. See, this is where it start opening up more and more discussion. This is why you have uh uh, decades of discussions when you start looking at it back at that time, because many are trying to take their own understandings, being wise in their own eyes. And now they what um, coming up doctrines, coming up with doctrines and creating further confusion. 
because guess what? This was this this Dabar HaKadosh was not given to the Roman Catholic Church. It was given to the people of Yah. His it was the Israelites who he made the covenant went with. But let me let me let me break this down, family. I got to break down. I and my father are one. Let's continue. Judah answered him saying. Oh, yeah. You know what? I see what I did here. Let me go back here. See what I said here. The Messiah also made reference to Psalms 82, the 82nd book of Psalms. I read it wrong. So let me show you here how Christ used this passage and really got up under their skin. Judah answered him saying, for a good work, we see, I mean, for a good work, we stone thee for not. So they saying, we see you, we see the miracles. We're not stoning you. We don't want to kill you. We don't want to take your life because you're performing miracles. But they say, but for blasphemy and because thou, and because that thou being a man makest thyself Allah right? Yeah, how was shy? Jesus the Christ answered them. It is not written. It what he said, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are Allah In other words, yours says God. So they're saying we're going to crucify you because you said you are God. But family, if you understand, it wasn't just because he said that he is um, part of the council. It's this part right here. I am my father are one because the father authority is above the council. So if the son is giving the authority under the title or the reputation of Emmanuel, that means that he has the authority of the father. Oh, come on, family. So they got mad because Christ is saying that he has the authority of Emmanuel. Oh, anyway, come on, family. Let's let's continue here. So. Uh, if he called them Allah unto whom the word Allah came and the scriptures cannot be broken. Come on, family. If Christ said the scriptures can't be broken, why are we allowing the church to break the scriptures by saying that we are not under the law? We don't have to honor. We, the, the Catholic church and the Christian church is based off of the tenets. Uh, they purposely have Sunday service, knowing that the Shabbat is on the seventh day. They created Sunday service. They created this whole thing that Christ rose on the early in the morning. They created that doctrine so that way they can have their own day designated and they can spew out their false doctrine. Minimize the father so they can raise the papa, the pope. Minimize the father so can, they can insert a system that can make things so generic that they kick the Israelites out. Come on, family. So Christ said the scriptures cannot be broken. So when you say that Christ uh, became our, our Shabbat, our rest, that's not even biblical. Because then now you're saying Christ, is, he broke the scriptures. Uh-oh, we, we, just, we just dropped a, a major nugget there. But let's continue, family. So what did Christ mean when he said, I and my father are one? Now we got to we got to answer this ele elephant in the room. I gave you a lot of information. We already knocked down some of the, the passages that many are used, but I'm going to further knock it down. I'm still dealing with Isaiah seven and Isaiah nine. I'm still dealing with Emmanuel, believe it or not. What did Christ mean when he said, I and my father are one? Let's address this. Let's go to the Greek heist. Right. We see heist. Right. It says this. One, one only family, that doesn't really give you much to go off of. This is why you got to go to that Hebrew. Pull out your Hebrew lexicon and, you know, we got to get out of this uh, this spirit of laziness that was pressed on us by our oppressors. We got we to get out of this dependency of having people to constantly spoon feed us. No, you should be proactive, right? This is your soul you, we're talking about. You have to be proactive to protect your body, protect your mind, your will, and your emotions. You have to study to show yourself approved. Now, let's go to the Hebrew. Let's see what it means. Let's go to Akkad. Let's see what one means in the Hebrew. Notice what it says here. It says united in example one. First, alone, together. But that's the key. United in example being one. But the key is united all together. And then we see together here. So Christ said he and he said when, when Christ said I and the father are united. Well, actually, let me say it. when he said we are one, when Christ said me and the father are one, what he's actually saying is me and the father. Christ is saying he and 
I, the father, my father are united and we are what? Together. That's what it means. Christ is saying me and the father are together. Me and the father are united. You cannot split us up. Going back to that marriage, when you think of Elohim or Allah, think about marriage. Use that word marriage because husband and wife, right? We are the reflection. Marriage is the reflection of what? Allah, because the two come together to be what? One. But when you see Pastor Richardson, you see my wife, Elder Serena Richardson. When you see Elder Serena Richardson, you see me. And when you see our children, you see who? Come on, family. That's the simplest way of explaining this here, what Christ is saying. Christ is saying, when you see me, I got the authority. When you see me, guess what? I have the authority. If someone knock on the door and, um, and ask for my wife or drop a package off, guess what? I have the authority to sign for that package. Guess what? In her name, guess what? That, hey, this is hers, that I have the authorization and vice versa. This is, man, and, and that's right, my brother, Brand, um, Brandon Blackwell. We got to connect my brother. You know, man, you doing, man, I love seeing your pictures, man, especially that latest picture you posted about your daughter with the mess you made, man. I really appreciate you, Ock. Yeah, I keep post, man. I, I I follow you. I just don't do a lot of posting because you know how that goes. You know, I just, you know, I like to just, uh, you know, love at afar. So if anything, uh, if you need my assistance, I'll jump in if need be. All right. You know how we do it. Love you, man. But that's right. We got to keep it simple. So Christ said he, in other words, I and my father are united. I and my father are one. Family, you can't make it no plainer than this. Like the Messiah, Israel is required to walk united and together with the father, starting with the councils. This is why Christ said to his disciples, think not that I come to destroy the law and the prophets. He said, I did not come to destroy that. Uh, I, can, I come to what? Fulfill. In other words, show you how to carry it out. And he told them, hey, not one jot, not one tittle. Don't even change. He told them, let your righteousness, righteous law abiding be above better than the, the Pharisees. So that means Christ wasn't telling them to walk away or denounce. He was telling them to what? He lifted up the standard. He put in them what the standard actually is. So like the Messiah, Israel is required. Those disciples are required to walk in unity, to walk with in togetherness with the father. Israel, when when the most high put judges, set those judges, those judges were supposed to be what? In unison with the father walking together. Let's prove this. Amos chapter three. This is one of the verses that many uh, mess up with uh, and, and push deceptive doctrine. Hear this word that Yahweh has spoken against you, O children of Israel. This is dealing with who? The Israelites. This is not dealing with anyone, no one else, but the Israelites. Hear this word that Yahweh has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family, which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, this is what he said, you only have I known of all the families of of the earth. Let me say that again. He didn't say he knew the Roman Catholic Church. He didn't say he knew the Romans. He didn't say any other community. He said only you. Only you, Israel. I'm not dealing with the other nation. I'm dealing with you, Israel. Only you, as you see here, only you have I known of all the families, right? Mosh, Pachath, of the earth, Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Can two walk together? You see the word walk, yala, together, yakad, yakad, sounds similar to akad, right? That means one, it also means together, except they be what? Agreed. Ida, bear witness. Right. So when we look at this here, family, this is Israel and the father, not two brothers and sisters. See, the church has taught this incorrectly. Hey, you know what? I mean, I'm, you just we have a disagreement. You you think one way. I think one way about the scriptures. Guess what? You know, this interpretation of this text. Guess what? Can two, uh, um, can two walk um, can two walk together except they agree. And guess what? This is why we have so many denominations inside the church today. 
This is why there's so many separation and split up among this awakening because of this poor understanding of this text. This is Israel and their walk with the father because Israel continuously rebelled against the father and went into sin. And that's why Yahweh was saying to them, how can we walk together and accept there be an agreement going back to what their covenant agree is the covenant. All right. So let's deal with it together. We see Yaqad sound like Akkad, right? Akkad means one, but it still could be synonymous with together because it says here a unit alike at all. In other words, once together, all together. Come on, family. It's just that simple. So Messiah clearly makes a distinction between he and the father. So why did the Israelites want to kill the Messiah? Was it because he referred to himself as the son of Yah? I believe so. So let's go back to John 10. Oh, family, we, we, I'm, I'm trying to end when we're, we're, we're going back to Isaiah. I'm getting there. Say ye of him whom the father have sanctified and sent into the world. Thou blasphemous, because I said I am the son, <laughs> but it's not just the son of Allah, but when he says son here, he's saying he's the son of who? The father. He's saying he is Emmanuel and they rejected him because he is the what? Son of the father. That's why they called it blasphemy. Not just because he's saying we are all Elohim or Allah or gods. He's saying he's they want to kill him because when he say that he is the son of the father, that means his authority is even above the council. Because the father has given him what? The authority based upon Isaiah chapter nine under the what title in Isaiah chapter seven, Emmanuel, which means Yah among us. Come on, family. Can I make it any plainer? Can I make it any plainer? But we're not going to stop here, fam. I'm getting there. If you, if I do not the works of my father, believe me not. He's This is Christ still paying homage, making sure that the father is above him. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the father is in me. And I and him. Come on, family. We're dealing with the authority. And guess what? The, the prophecies told us that the spirit of Yah was going to be permanent on him. That's why I say when you say Holy Spirit, generic. But when you say the spirit of Yah, that's the prophecy that the, the, the that the spirit of Yah was going to be is was going to always remain on him and in him. Oh, come on, family. Anyway. So Christ has said, the Father is in me. And I in him. In other words, we are together. Come on, family. we cannot get away from it. The Messiah was disrespected. I mean, the Messiah was dis. Um, let me see. The Messiah was disrespected. Yeah, this is supposed to be. I got to type this, man. I got to go back over this. The Messiah was disrespected, not only saying that he is the son of Allah, but ultimately he was ridiculed because of saying his authority is above theirs. He ultimately, when he says that he's the son of the father, right, that means that he's telling them that his authority is above their counsel. Because remember, Allah Elohim means what? Counsel, magistrate, judges. So he's telling them his authority is above theirs. And they're like, hey, that's blasphemy. We got to kill you. So is Yahweh is exclusively is referring to Yahweh. Right. Exclusively a renewed or new testament thing is supposed to be is referring to yahweh as the father uh let me let me type uh, man i got a lot of typos i'm gonna have to blame jay heist out for this man man i butcher this just tell you i was just working and working and working trying to ple piece this together and um i got a lot of typos I, I have to take an hour to go back over this but anyway is referring to yahweh exclusively um i mean uh yahweh as the father exclusively a uh, renewed. Let me, let me, yeah, let me fix this. I'm getting a family. That question is all jacked up. Mess me up. We're trying to figure it out. It's bad when you got to sit there and try to <laughs> figure that thing out. Let me fix it real quick. All right, come on. 
All right. All right, that's that's how it's supposed to read, family. All right, so is referring. I still messed it up. <laughs> Let me see here. Let me do it one more time. All right, there we go. So is referring to Yahweh as the father, exclusively a renewed or New Testament thing. All right, let me ask that question. Is uh, referring to the father, is referring to the father, is referring to the father exclusively, you know, uh, designated to the New Testament? I'm going to answer this question, right? And as you see, no, <laughs> right? It's not. Let's go to Isaiah 63. And we're going to close off with these passages because there's a lot more I could teach, but I'm already hitting two hours. Let's go to Isaiah 63, starting at verse 15. Watch this family. Look down from heaven and behold from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory. Where is thy zeal and thy strength, the sounding of thy bowels and thy and, and of thy mercies towards me? Are they restrained? Doubtless thou art our Abaya through of uh, Abraham be ignorant of us and Israel acknowledge us not. Oh, no, notice this here. Thou, oh, Yahweh Abaya art what? Notice what it says here. Art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. We just dropped the mic right here. See, Emmanuel is a representation. Emmanuel, the title, has the authority of the father. But guess what? Emmanuel is not the father, right? Right? But operating in the authority, going back to that word sham. But we see here that Abba Yah, Yahweh Abba Yah, right? Art thou, art our father? Wait a minute. So Isaiah is making it clear that Yahweh is our father, our redeemer. Thy name, this is literal as well as his reputation, is from everlasting. So this is saying this is not changing. There's not going to be another father. When you say that the Messiah is the father, now you're teaching another father. No, the Messiah has the authority of the, of the father. And this is why the father, I mean, Christ said me and the father are one. Akkad, we are one. We are together. He says whenever he sent out his disciples, he said, tell them the kingdom of who? Heaven is at hand. In other words, the authority was given to them to cast out those demons that they had to deal with. So Christ is making it clear that his authority comes directly from the father under the title, under the reputation of Emmanuel. Come on, man. Class dismissed. We'll close out right here. There's a distinction between the two. But that does not take away from the divinity of the Messiah. You know what's interesting when you study about the Council of Nicaea? Why these, uh, these people arguing about the deity of Christ. Hey, did he become a deity once he was raised from the dead or did he become a, was he divine before? I mean, before he's born, you know, uh, you know, they was arguing about this and Constantine even wrote a letter saying, Hey, you know what? These people are crazy. It's not y'all making a mountain out of the, uh, a mole here. Y'all, y'all guys is y'all, y'all guys are crazy. Even Constantine was like, look, yo, you guys, man, this, you guys are arguing over something that y'all shouldn't even be arguing over. Come on, fam. I gave you nothing but scripture. I did not interpolate it. I gave you nothing but scripture. Nothing but scripture. And I'll just give you this last passage. Isaiah 64, 7 and 8. And there is none. <laughs> and there is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us and has consumed us because of our iniquities. Verse eight. But now, O Yahweh, Abba, Yah, thou art 
our father. Didn't Christ use that at his beginning of his prayer? He said, when you pray, when the disciples went to him, he said, this is how you pray. You pray our father. That means that Christ is underneath the father as well. He says, our father. So Christ is literally uh, uh, doing exactly and, and quoting exactly what Isaiah has quoted here. Thou art our father. Now this taking us back to uh, Isaiah chapter seven, Isaiah chapter nine, and it shatters all this terrible teaching that we've been uh, subjected to tearing down these strongholds. Many of us have paid, spent tens of thousands to get educated in those theological systems and come up with what? Uh, and uh, become agents to further push their agendas. And like my grandmother used to say, the devil is a liar. You guys are free whom the sun set free. You are free indeed. Thou art our father, Yahweh Abaya. That's how you start your prayer. Our father. And the Messiah didn't take away from it. The Messiah never said that he was the father. He never put himself one, uh, be one, uh, in other words, having the equal authority of the father. He always submitted himself to the father, but the father has given him authority to do things and what? His name under the authority of being the father, um, to be over the council underneath who the father. So we'll stop right here because I, I I still got a lot more of this presentation to go. And we already hit two hours and 15 minutes. I hope and pray this helps you guys. This is why I wanted to do a special lunchtime session. And I encourage you guys go back over. And look, brothers and sisters, I, for those that uh, may uh, have SARS early to um, when we blocking out people that sit up here being disruptive, that's not being that's not trying to be rude and disrespectful. But we have to have decorum because, man, so many people want to learn. But we keep allowing this distraction to happen. Man, I don't I'm not debating a word. If you don't like what is being said, go elsewhere. You don't have to be disruptive. But I hope this tide everything together to give you proper clarity. I hope this giving you proper clarity so that way you can actually go and free your brothers and sisters that are still teaching this doctrine, this Trinitarian doctrine, and don't even realize that they are blaspheming who the father. Come on, family. And I just proved and took you all the way back to the very scripture that many are using out of order. With that being said, family, with that being said, in the words of the Most High, Yahweh, Yahweh Abba Yah, I'm saying his title with it, Father Yahweh. In the words of Yahweh Abba Yah that he gave to Moses in Exodus chapter 15, verse 13 and 14, fear ye not, stand still, see the salvation of Yahweh, these Egyptians that you see here today, that Christian doctrine, that Catholic doctrine, all these different uh, teachings and uh, uh, theologies that have been placed on us will never have power over us ever again. The Most High will fight for us. But guess what, family? We have to hold our peace. Let me say that again. Fear ye not. Stand still. See the salvation of Yahweh. These strongholds, these Egyptians that you see here today, these this deceptive doctrine of our of these colonizers will never have power over us ever again. The Most High will fight for us. But here's the kicker. We have to hold our peace. Can't go back. Can't stay here. Keep moving forward. Shalom. Listen, Genesis chapter 11, verse 10, explains the genealogy of Shem. Shem was a black man in Africa. If you repeat this back, Genesis 14, verse 13, Abraham steps on the scene. Being a descendant of Shem, which is a fact, means Abraham too was black. Abraham, born in the city of a black man, called Nimrod, grandson of Ham. Ham had four sons. One was named Cain. Here, let me do some explaining. Abraham, Isaac was the Jacob had 12 sons, for real. And these were the children of Israel. According to Genesis chapter 10, these were the children of Israel.